Most people have heard of the hole in the ozone layer, but fewer perhaps understand what caused it, and perhaps fewer still really understand why it was, and still is really, such a big deal. Let's take a closer look at stratospheric ozone depletion. Ozone is a substance which occurs naturally in the Earth's atmosphere. The molecules are made up of three oxygen atoms bonded together, rather than the two bonded together which make up the molecular oxygen that we all breathe. The main function of ozone, as far as human beings and other living creatures are concerned, is that it prevents UVC radiation and some UVB radiation from reaching the Earth's surface. Without this layer of ozone, most of which can be found between 15 and 30 kilometers up in the Earth's stratosphere, a greater amount of radiation would reach the Earth's surface, causing cellular damage to life forms. Now, the amount of ozone in the atmosphere above us at any one time depends both on latitude and on the time of year. The majority is produced by plants and trees near the equator where ozone concentrations tend to be highest. With changes in seasonal wind patterns known as the Brewer-Dobson cycle, circulating the gas in such a way that it hits a high in the spring and a low in the autumn. Despite these fluctuations, however, the total amount of ozone in the atmosphere tends to be quite stable over long periods of time. Or at least it was until human beings began producing and emitting chemicals which actively destroy it. In 1931, American chemical engineer Thomas Midgley Jr. invented a method for synthesizing a family of gases called chlorofluorocarbons, known more simply as CFCs. Used primarily in the manufacture of air conditioning units, refrigerators and aerosols, CFCs were incredibly useful due to their low flammability and toxicity, which made them particularly useful for widespread consumer distribution. However, by the 1970s, evidence began to emerge that CFC molecules were making their way into the upper atmosphere, where they acted as a catalyst for the destruction of ozone molecules. In fact, CFC molecules, once they've made their way up into the stratosphere, stay there for several decades. And over the course of that time, just one molecule can break down 100,000 ozone molecules. Now, by the late 1980s, it became overwhelmingly apparent that CFCs and other ozone-depleting substances had created a massive area of low ozone concentration covering the Antarctic, an area of very thinly spread ozone, but not, as popular misconception would have it, a hole as such. In fact, to this day, ozone concentrations over Australia and New Zealand can very occasionally get low enough to prompt health concerns over increased risk of skin cancer. So what happened? Well, just 18 months after the discovery of this area of depleted ozone over the Antarctic, the international community agreed to phase out the use of CFCs completely by 2030 under what was known as the Montreal Protocol. This piece of legislation is widely considered to be one of the most successful examples of global cooperation in tackling an environmental issue. In fact, CFC reductions in reality were much more rapid than what was set out originally in the protocol. By 2012, the world had phased out 98% of ozone depleting substances with high levels of compliance among all 197 signatories to the Montreal Protocol, with a handful of exceptions. In recent years, CFC-11 emissions have been detected emanating from eastern China, whilst Russia has been accused at various times of tolerating a black market in CFCs. So what effect has all of this had on the ozone layer? Is it recovering? Well, there are signs of a recovery in the thickness of ozone at the Earth's poles, However, given that CFCs last for several decades, there is likely to be a lag between halting emissions and a full recovery in the Earth's natural radiation shield. However, unless signatories shirk their responsibilities under the Montreal Protocol and CFC emissions start to rise sharply again, a full recovery is indeed where we're headed. This is, for the most part, a rare example of an environmental success story. Such a success does beg the question, however, if the international community can be brought together in record time to solve stratospheric ozone depletion, why can't we do the same for other, perhaps more pressing environmental issues, like climate change? Well, one potential explanation is that tackling climate change requires a great deal more sacrifice than the battle against CFC emissions. Cutting out carbon has deep implications for how we live our lives, from 
our work, to how we move, to how we eat. The world economy is still so dependent on fossil fuel combustion that phasing out those emissions at the same rate as CFCs, proportionally speaking, would just crash everything. That is without replacing it first with an entirely new structure for the economy that everybody can agree on. In contrast, the economic effects of cutting CFCs went little beyond the cost of researching alternatives and increasing the cost of air conditioning and fridges a bit. So what's the main upshot of this story? The success of the Montreal Protocol proves that meaningful action on global environmental challenges is possible, but when the solutions are awkward, expensive, unpopular, we all have to push a little bit harder to get things done.